Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, can y'all do me a huge favor and give the Road Family Ministry team and all of the volunteers a huge round of applause? They put on a tremendous conference every year, and it's just a, a huge blessing to this congregation uh, to get to know some of you from outside the congregation and to hear from all of these tremendous speakers. As Phil said a minute ago, I feel incredibly blessed just to be here as a, as a learner, as a student, as a dad. I've already gained, I feel like, so much from the things that I've heard already this morning, and it is so, so incredibly important that we be intentional in our Christian discipleship, our Christian parenting. And so I also want to say thank you to all of you who are here today and chose to be here rather than anywhere else you could be on a Saturday. Thank you for being here. Thank you for caring about uh, your own walk with the Lord and your, your parenting or your grandparenting or whether you're an aunt or uncle or whatever role you play in the family. Thank you for doing that and thank you for being here so that we can all uh, grow and be stronger and better in, uh, in our Christian parenting. So we are talking about parenting in a political world. I, I always appreciate Matt and think, you know, it's, it's really a really kind and generous, gracious thing that he allows me to be part of the conference and speak, uh, even though everybody here hears from me uh, too much and, and all too often. I think, what a nice guy that he would allow me to be part of the conference. And then he gives me this topic. And I think, thanks a lot, Matt. Thanks a lot. I'm not, you know, I think back to some of my earliest memories in regards to politics. Uh, it's interesting that right now uh, we were in the midst of an impeachment uh, trial. Um, and I think back to when I was a young person and our country was in a similar type of a situation. And I remember even as a teenager, yes, I was a teenager 22 years ago, um, and, and I remember uh, talking about that with my friends, you know, Clinton and what was going on with the impeachment, and I, I think I didn't know anything what I was talking about. I was just parroting whatever my parents told me, which is a huge thing to kind of stop and think that even though my thoughts around politics have changed tremendously in 20 years, uh, it also reminds me that that's where we all started. That's sort of our baseline. What we think about the world and how we think the world should operate and what role politics and human governments play in the world, uh, it sort of begins with what did your mom and dad tell you about that? What did your parents think about those things? What did they say when the evening news was on? And, and that's sort of where we begin. And even though our journey may go in a different direction from there, it starts there. So it's incredibly important that we help our young people start well and learn how to think about what's going on in the world. And in our house, we don't, we don't have a whole lot of news on. We don't have a whole lot of politics on. Every now and then, the boys will hear uh, like a sound bite, or they'll read something that someone tweeted or something. You know, I'm not saying anything, but I'm just saying, you know, every now and then, they will uh, come to me and they say, this happened or that happened, or I heard this or I heard that, and they'll have questions about those things. The other day, uh, it was probably 9.30. It's funny how these conversations never happen in the middle of the day when everybody's thinking clearly, but the kids always ask me. I've got an 11-year-old and an 8-year-old, and they never want to talk about deep things in the middle of the day. It's always like at 9.30 at night, I'm ready to go to bed. I'm ready for them to go to bed. And Malachi will say, so what's this about Iran, you know? And, and he'll ask me, you know, so he hears that someone is killed in Iran, and then... And how he picks up on these things. My kids are homeschooled. I don't know who they're hanging around. That they're talking about Iran. But, but somehow he hears that, that someone in Iran is killed and that he's afraid that we might go to war. And so he asks me, what, what happened? Why did it happen? Is there a chance we could go to war? His, his question always, this is his big question, is what's the worst case scenario? <laughs> That's what he wants to know. 11 years old, what's the worst case scenario? But, you know, I was really thinking through some of the questions that they've asked me and some of the things that, you know, I've tried to instill in them. And, and their questions revolve around a lot, like, what do we think about this? Like, what do we think about this? Who's right? Who's wrong? Why do some people think this? But they really want to know, like, who are the good guys 
Who are the bad guys? What are we for? What are we against? And as I thought through a lot of those things and, and how I try to have those conversations with my kids, it, it, it occurred to me that even though we may come from different, um, different political views, even in this room, but especially in this world and in this country, and a lot of people think very differently about politics and what the role of government should be or shouldn't be, what the role we should have in those governments should be or shouldn't be, I think that there's some things that we all have in common. So regardless of our political views, regardless of our political views, all parents really want at least these three things, I think. Number one, to reassure our children about the future. We want to give them hope, right? Sometimes they're scared and things happen in, things have happened in all of our lifetimes that are terrifying and we want to know what's the worst case scenario. What might happen because of this? What's coming because of this? If this happens, if this person is elected or this person isn't elected or if this changes or if that happens or we go to war or this thing happens, what's, what's the future going to look like? And regardless of our political views, we all want to reassure our children about the future. We all want to give them hope. We all want to give them courage. Number two, we want to give them a moral compass to navigate challenging issues. We want to have, as Phil talked about in the, in the first session, and I love that he talked about wisdom. We want to give our children wisdom, don't we? We want to give them guidance. We want to help them to know because we don't even know. I mean, that's the thing. Don't tell our kids, but we don't know what the future holds in a lot of ways, do we? We don't know what changes are going to happen in the next 10 or 15 or 20 years on the political landscape. We don't know what issues will become forefront. We wouldn't have guessed 20 years ago that some of the things that we're dealing with now would be coming in 20 years, would we? And, and, and so we don't know everything that our kids are going to have to deal with and the decisions that they're going to have to make and the issues that they're going to have to navigate, but we want to help them to have this wisdom and guidance so that when those issues do come up, they'll know how to navigate those things. Number three, to help shape their sense of identity. James did an awesome job in, in the breakout session I was in in the auditorium talking about identity. And we want to help shape our children's identity to understand their place in the world. Who are we? And that was one of the things that, that Malachi kept asking when he was asking about, is it possible that we go to war? What happens if we go to war? And my answer to him, and you may disagree with me or not, I don't know, but I, my answer was, well, we are not going to war. But I want my kids to have a firm grasp on who is we. Who are we? Who am I? Who are we as a family? Who are we as God's people? So as Christians who want to reassure our children about the future, who want to give our children a moral compass to navigate challenging issues, as Christian parents who want to help shape their children's identity and understand their place in the world, how do we do this? How do we navigate politics as Christians? And here's something I think that I, I want to grasp and to communicate to you is that Christianity isn't just my religion, it is my politics. And I don't mean, I don't just mean it shapes my politics, I mean it is my politics. It's also my nationality. And if you want to get right down to it, according to 1 Peter, it's my ethnicity as well. Christianity is my politics. It is my nationality, it's my ethnicity, it's my identity, it's who I am and everything about me. In fact, the word Christian, the word Christ, is a political term. Do we understand that? I mean, if we just said Jesus is my rabbi, and that would be true too, right? I mean, Jesus is my religious teacher. That would be a religious term, an educational term. But if we say Jesus is the Christ, that means Jesus is king. Jesus is king. And make no mistake, in the first century or the 21st century, that is a political claim. When you say, I am a Christian, that, that means, whether we've embraced all of the implications to that or not, when we say we are Christians, we're saying, this is the king to whom I am swearing my allegiance. 
That's a, that's a political idea. We're saying, I belong to this king and to his kingdom. This is who I am. This is who we are. And so, like, as a family, we've tried to do some things to help shape their identity around this idea. Like, every night before we say our prayers, we say the Shema and, and add to that what Jesus did. We say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and your mind and your strength. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Because this is what our king teaches us to do. This is who we are. We are followers of this king. This is our kingdom. This is our politics. This is our nationality. This is who we are. We are followers of Jesus. And when you think about, I want to put this chart up here for just a second, heaven's kingdom and earthly kingdoms. Here's the interesting, and again, this is, you know, kind of deep theologically, I guess, but I think it has so many practical implications. When you think about what the prophet said about the coming of God's kingdom. When you think about what the prophet said about the Messiah and about his reign, earlier Phil was talking about the book of Daniel, and you think about what Daniel envisioned and saw about the reign of the Son of Man and, and the coming of God's kingdom, you almost would have had the idea from all of the prophets that when God's kingdom gets here, all of the earthly kingdoms would be done. That there's going to be this era and age of all of the earthly kingdoms, and then that's going to come to an end, and then all of the rest of ever is God's eternal kingdom. But the surprising thing about the gospel, the surprising thing when Jesus came, and 99.9% .9 of everything Jesus said was about the kingdom. And he told so many parables to help his people to understand this is what the kingdom is like. The kingdom of heaven is like this. The kingdom of heaven is like that. And a lot of it revolved around this idea right here. That it's not going to be what you thought. Because you thought the kingdom was going to come and it was just going to come huge and it was going to explode on the scene. And that all the earthly kingdoms were done and now it's the age of heaven's kingdom. But there's actually this era of overlap where these earthly kingdoms will continue to exist but heaven's kingdom has already begun. It will continue to run forever into the future. And these earthly kingdoms, they will come to an end. All of them. Babylon and Rome, and Greece and America, they will all come to an end eventually. But God's kingdom will last forever. And in this sort of in-between time, we're living with this sort of parallel kingdom dichotomy where you have heaven's kingdom that has been established and the Son of Man is reigning and you also have these earthly kingdoms that exist in parallel. So how do God's people who belong to this heavenly kingdom interact with and live in and deal with the earthly kingdoms that we know are going to come to an end? We know they're passing away and their time is limited. And that we're citizens of the heavenly kingdom, which will not pass away. How do we live in this in-between time? We don't live in opposition to the earthly kingdoms, do we? we? We don't exist to destroy them or tear them down. They will come to an end, and God's kingdom will bring them to an end. But we do not live in opposition to earthly kingdoms, but we do live in contrast to earthly kingdoms. Our job is not to oppose them, but to expose them, isn't it? And here's my parenting philosophy. My goal is not to raise patriots. My goal is not to raise rebels. My goal is to raise disciples of Jesus. See, a patriot is one who is afraid. A patriot is driven by fear that something bad might bring his kingdom to an end, right? And so I will do anything I can to keep my kingdom from coming to an end. Except we understand as followers of Jesus and those who have sworn our allegiance to him that these kingdoms will come to an end. So what a futile thing to raise my boys to be patriots who live in constant fear of their kingdom coming to an end. I know it is going to come to an end. And you don't have to be afraid of that. 
You don't have to fear that because the kingdom to which we belong, the heavenly kingdom, the kingdom to which we are citizens, that kingdom will never come to an end. So my goal isn't to raise them to be patriots, to live in constant fear of their kingdom, their country coming to an end, but nor is it to raise rebels who live in constant fear of the perpetuation of a kingdom, right? A rebel is terrified that this kingdom that exists, it's always going to exist and it's always going to be terrible and so I've got to tear it down. But disciples of Jesus don't have to fear either of those things. Do we? We don't have to fear the continuation of a particular earthly kingdom and we don't have to fear the, the end of that particular earthly kingdom. My goal as a parent, and I hope that's true of all of us, regardless of what we think our interaction should be with the earthly kingdoms, because some of us may say, oh, I don't want us to have anything to do with earthly kingdoms. Some of us say, no, we need to have influence on these earthly kingdoms. But regardless of how much or how little interaction you think we ought to have with earthly kingdoms, hopefully we can all agree that our goal is to raise our children to be followers of Jesus. And for that king and his kingdom to be where their allegiance and true citizenship lies. But I want to look at a couple different texts to help us sort of think through our role. And one of them is from Jeremiah chapter 29. Now, I love the fact that Phil brought up Daniel and the Babylonian exile. Because that's exactly what Jeremiah deals with here as well. And again, think, think through it because our situation is so similar, isn't it? Here were these exiles who were taken out of Jerusalem, out of Judah, and taken away to a foreign kingdom. And they were living in exile away from their kingdom. So they're like, yeah, I mean, my citizenship isn't here, it's there. It's in Jerusalem. When Daniel prayed, he prayed towards Jerusalem because that's where his citizenship lied. But in the meantime, he still had to live in and dwell in and be a part of and interact with the kingdom of Babylon. Just like you and I, we know that we are citizens of the heavenly kingdom, but we live in and deal with and interact with this kingdom, this country, this nation. And I love what Jeremiah writes to them because Jeremiah is writing to the exiles and he's telling them, listen, you got a lot of false prophets running around and they're telling you, just don't worry about it. Like, don't get plugged in here in Babylon. You're going to go back to Jerusalem pretty soon. This thing's going to be over before you know it. Blink of the eye, you'll be back in Jerusalem. So don't, don't put down any roots here. And Jeremiah says, that's not true. So Jeremiah gives them a word from the Lord. Verse 4, he says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I've sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them. Plant gardens, eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that, that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. And that's kind of interesting, isn't it? That Jeremiah writing to the exile said, nope, settle in. And don't just settle in, build houses, plant gardens. You're going to be here for a while. This is going to be home for a while. In fact, it will be home for the rest of your generation and on to the next generation. Verse 7. But, and here it's just amazing what Jeremiah says, seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. Into Babylon. Seek the welfare of Babylon and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. When the city thrives and does well, so will you. And if bad things happen to the city, it's going to happen to you too because you live there. This is your home now. Don't pray for God to destroy Babylon. You're going to be intertwined with Babylon. You're going to be in Babylon. You're going to build your houses and plant your gardens in Babylon. This is where life is going to happen. So pray for the city and seek the welfare of the city. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you and don't listen to the dreams that they dream, for it's a lie that they're prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I'll visit you and I'll fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know, here's the verse we all know, right? Verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil to give you a future 
and a hope. Three things came to my mind reading that and thinking through our, our text or our idea today. Number one, this isn't your kingdom, but it is your home, right? And that was true for the, the exiles living in Babylon. Babylon's not your kingdom. This isn't your kingdom, but it is your home. This is where you live. And that's true for us as well, isn't it? This isn't your kingdom. And we have to remember that, church. This isn't my kingdom. America is not my kingdom. But it is my home. It is my home. I can love it. I can enjoy it. I can be thankful for it. I can pray for it. It is my home. But it's not my kingdom. Number two. Be a blessing to your neighbors because your welfare is tied to theirs. Be a blessing to your neighbors. This isn't the idea where you just retreat and you just live off by yourself and you say, I don't know, they're not my people. That's not us. Whatever happens to them, who cares? That's not my people. My people are over here. My people are the Jewish people. My people are God's people. All of them, I don't know what's going to happen to them. They're not my people. That's not how God taught the exiles to live in Babylon. And that's not how we should live in this kingdom either. Seek the welfare of your neighbors. Be a blessing. This may not be my kingdom. My kingdom is a heavenly kingdom. But my task here in this kingdom, in my home, is to be a blessing to my neighbors. To interact in such a way that I bring about their welfare. God wanted the Jewish people living in Babylon to be a blessing to the city. Number three, your ultimate hope, your ultimate hope should be in the plans God has for you beyond this kingdom, right? That was true for them, it's true for us. God says, I know the plans I have for you, plans to bless you, plans to prosper you. I'm going to bless you. That needs to be where your hope is, not in the policies of Babylon, Babylon would continue to have a lot of really bad policies. Sometimes the king would, man, have a change of heart and things would be really good and that's good. Sometimes things would be really bad and that was bad. But their ultimate hope wasn't tied to some political policy that Babylon would have. Their ultimate hope was tied to the promises that God had made to his people. And all three of these things ought to be true for us as well, shouldn't they? That as we live in this country, we say, you know what? This is my home. This is my home. I was born here. I love these people. These are my neighbors. Whatever country we're in, whether we're in the United States or in Canada or in Mexico, anywhere in the world, this, this may not be my kingdom, but it is my home. And my job here is to be a blessing to my neighbors, whoever my neighbors are, and bless them and seek their welfare. But my ultimate hope is not tied up in this kingdom because I know for a fact that this kingdom will come to an end. My ultimate hope is not tied to what's going to happen with these policies or who's going to be the president or who's going to be in Congress or who's going to sit on the Supreme Court. None of my hope is tied to those things ultimately because my hope is tied to the promises that God has made to his people. And then as you get into the New Testament and you think through what some of the apostles had to say to Christians who now their citizenship belongs to God and they've sworn their allegiance to a new king and to his kingdom, but they're still living in Rome, right? They're still living under an emperor. And I think about texts like Romans chapter 12. So get your Bible, Romans 12, verse 9. Here's the marching orders for Christian people who are living under an earthly kingdom, just like us. Some kingdoms have been better, some kingdoms have been worse, but here's our marching orders. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. We could just sit there and camp out for the rest of the day, couldn't we? When it comes to politics and how we deal with politics and how we're raising our children and what they're thinking about their hope, what they're thinking about tribulation, 
Are things hard at times for different people in different groups? Are things hard for Christian people at different times living in kingdoms? But what does God, through Paul, tell us to do? He tells us to rejoice in hope. Your hope is not tied to the state of the United States of America. It's not. You can rejoice in spite of how well or how poorly things are going in the United States or any country in the world. Because our hope is in the future of the kingdom of heaven. But to, but to follow some of us on Facebook or on Twitter, <laughs> to listen to the things that we say, you would think that we were hopeless depending on who's in the White House or who's not. You would think we're hopeless depending on what is happening in politics. What's happening in Washington, D.C. is affecting with whether or not we think we can have hope and rejoice. Where does our hope lie? And as Christian parents, I want my boys to know whether you, the United States goes to war or not, or who's elected or who's not, or who's impeached or who's not, or who's in Congress or who's not, I want them to know that this is not where our hope lies. And we will rejoice in our hope because our hope supersedes whatever is happening in this country or where, whatever is happening in the world. He says, be patient in tribulation. We really haven't even seen tribulation, most of us, have we? Not tribulation like the first century church saw. And God tells his people, be patient. Be patient. Sometimes, church, when I see the way we react to even the possibility of tribulation, even the possibility of persecution, we abandon our Christian morals, we abandon our ethics. We abandon speaking well about people and speaking well to people because we're afraid we might face tribulation. Even the threat of tribulation has caused us to be so impatient with each other that the things that we say to one another online are just appalling. And don't you know our kids are picking up on that? If that's what we're saying to somebody online, if that's what we're saying to people on the other side of the aisle, if that's what we're saying to people and about people who disagree with our politics because we're afraid that maybe we'll have to suffer some tribulation or persecution, our kids are ingesting that, picking up on that, and it's shaping them. And some of them are saying, yeah, that's right, Dad, that's right, Mom, those horrible, no good people, and you know, they're, it's shaping them that way. And others are saying, I don't want to have anything to do with whatever philosophy has led them to live like that. And if, and if our kids are tying our vitriolic politics to our Christianity and lumping them together and saying if that's how Christians treat people who disagree with them politically, I don't want to have anything to do with it. It's a shame. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those. Here's where it gets real hard. You thought it was hard before. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not what? Do not curse them. When they do what? persecute you. Church, we're cursing them far be before they, they persecute us when we think that their politics might lead to us maybe sort of kind of being persecuted. We're cursing them then. And God through Paul says, no, not my people. This is not how you live in Babylon. Babylon. This is not how you live in exile. This is not how you live in the kingdom of heaven as it runs parallel to the kingdoms of earth. You don't, you don't curse them when they persecute you. In fact, you bless them. You bless them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil. Give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. Now, now, none of this means that we don't have convictions about what's right or what's wrong or even ideas about what we think policy should be. 
And wouldn't it be great if policies were X, Y, and Z? Or wouldn't it be great if policies were this way or that way? We can have opinions on those. In fact, you may even believe that Christians should interact with the earthly kingdoms to bring about those policies. I don't have a problem with any of that. And I don't know that any of that goes against with what, what Paul is saying. But if we can't do it without violating these things, then we better rethink the way we do politics and the way we talk about politics, and the way we think about politics. Because this kingdom, this earthly kingdom, is short-lived, and the kingdom of heaven is forever. And Jesus says this is how citizens of the kingdom of God behave. Here's how we ought to behave. Give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. Give thought. That phrase means think ahead. Think ahead about what you're saying or about what you're about to do and think, how might this be interpreted? How might this be perceived? In order to do that, here's what you have to do. It's really hard. Not many of us are very good at it, but you have to listen to people. If you don't listen to people, you have no idea what's honorable in their sight and what's not. That especially means you better listen to people who have a different political leaning than you do. You better listen to people who look different than you, who think different than you, who came from a different neighborhood than you came from, who come from a different socioeconomic level than you. You have to listen to people because our job in this world as we are representatives of the kingdom of heaven is to give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves. Leave it to the wrath of God, for it's written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink, for by so doing, you'll you'll heap burning coals on his head. Do not be, here are our marching orders, here is our policy. As people who belong to the kingdom of heaven, here's what our king tells us to do. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's our job. That's our job, church. Do you want to bring about good? And most people do, don't they? Most people want to bring about good. Even if we disagree with how they're doing it, they think their policies will bring about good. They think their candidates will bring about good. You think your policies will bring about good. You think your candidates will bring about good. But Jesus says, here's how you ultimately bring about good. Do good. Do good. You don't overcome evil with doing more evil. You don't overcome evil through compromise. You don't overcome evil by partnering with evil. You overcome evil with good. We have to remember what kingdom we're part of. So here's just the thought that I want us to leave with today. This country may be your home, but don't let it be your hope. This country may be your home. It may not be your home. I don't know where everybody's from. This may not be your home. But whatever country you're from, it may be your home. But don't let it be your hope. Don't let it be your hope. If something is your hope, it means that it has become an ultimate thing. I love the way Tim Keller talks about idolatry because he says idolatry is when a good thing A created thing becomes an ultimate thing, becomes something that you believe in your heart of hearts, I can't live without this. And when something that's a good thing and a created thing becomes an ultimate thing, something you think, I can't live without this, then it has become an idol to you. And it's possible for political candidates, for political ideas, for countries and kingdoms and nations to become idols to us. For us to say, this is my hope. If these policies don't stay intact, or if these policies don't come to fruition, or if this candidate doesn't get elected, or if this candidate is removed, or if this country doesn't stand, then I don't know how I could live without this. Everything would come crashing down. It has become our hope, and if it's become our hope, it's become our idol. And we cannot allow that to happen. We've got to be the kind of people that love our neighborhood, love our city, love our country, love our world, love our enemies, 
and love our Lord and that our hope is in Jesus and in his kingdom and that we go about bringing about good the way Jesus taught us to do. Selfless love and faithfulness to God. We listen to each other and do good to each other. And then we, we teach our children to do the same. And, and our whole theme this weekend is fearless faith. <laughs> That's what we want our kids to have, isn't it? A fearless faith. Not only standing up for what's right, Standing up for people that can't stand up for themselves. Speaking for people that can't speak for themselves. Unafraid to do the right thing. But also, kids that grow up, become adults, and can switch on the news and not lose their mind. Can get on Facebook or get on Twitter and share their ideas and their thoughts without just letting all kinds of ridiculous stuff come out of their mouth. That's the way I want us to raise our kids, don't you? Kids who are truly citizens of the kingdom of God. Thank you, church.